So, the ones with a lot of video game delays. Imagine delaying something, couldn't it be me? Video game release dates are a tricky business. You end up formally announcing when you're about to drop some brand spanking new hits and the date comes and hey, my favorite form of disappointment, crippling. Delays come in all shapes and sizes, always intended for the better to create a higher quality experience at the cost of some fan disappointments, but that doesn't stop piss and shit from being piss and shit. I kid, sorta, but if delaying a game is necessary to preserve the vision for the core experience, under the right circumstances, a lot of games can benefit from this. And as long as delays are for genuinely good reasons, then yeah, if the devs aren't sitting around eating bugs or whatever they do, that extra time spent tweaking and improving can go a long way in polishing up the collective efforts of a team of passionate, dedicated, and creative people. Oh, hey, Sega! Yeah, suddenly this video title feels a little off. Video game cancellations. Mega Man Legends 3 existed? No, it didn't. Game development is a tricky business, combining so many art forms into one and making it interesting, which is a huge feat in and of itself. Going on to release a video game and critical acclaim, now you just make enough hypotheticals. But any game, for whatever reason, can end up with a considerable amount of hype behind it, so nothing stings more than having that big old AAA piss vest you were looking forward to for years kick the bucket. And we have the infamous concept of scrapped video games to thank for that. The cancellation of any big title, for one reason or another, will more often than not have the publisher want to shove it under the the rug, wipe clean, and start over. Which is perfectly understandable, nobody wants a corpse lying around. Also, in the modern age of the internet, the mere idea of this nowadays is nearly impossible, and with any major piece of modern media released or not, as long as even the scarcest of details are made public to some degree, it'll almost always fall victim to any and all behind the scenes development content seemingly inevitably getting leaked. That's just how internet culture is. Yeah, that's right, relentless and unforgiving. People are just naturally curious about vaulted media, with the very concept of information being withheld from the public being enough of a reason to drive people's interest to seek out answers, encouraging a sense of wonder and mystery to be uncovered. And hey, nowadays, living in an era of decompilers and social media, almost anything can be fished for country features or concepts, as long as they're left over in game files. And with such a direct method of communicating with fans, artists and developers are free to actually show off art, music, concepts, ideas, anything that didn't make the cut. Hell, even art books are starting to become more and more common for big studio games, shows, and movies. My point being, today it's not a rare sight to see people more open and comfortable sharing their creative process, what did and didn't work, synonyms, and that's honestly a really cool precedent to set. That being said though, focusing on anything post-2000 means I don't have content to discuss today, so let's run it back to the mid-90s, where the prevalence of the console worlds is imminent, and Mario vs Sonic's the talk of the town. It was brutal, cancels games from this era weren't even given the benefit of a public statement half the time. Sure, you might have caught a glimpse of Kid Kirby, or maybe you just hallucinated your entire childhood, either or. Regardless of how many elusive entities ended up haunting the dreams of completely clueless kids back in the early console generations, one canned game remains potentially one of the most infamous examples of all time. Sega's own Sonic and that's why Butch Harmon sucks part 37. Thanks for watching. Extreme. We what? Sonic the Hedgehog. Never before have I shuddered in such anticipation of the possible related topics to talk about regarding this franchise. Sonic's a neat little dude with a lot of history, and that sentence stops here. I mean, I could sit here and spit out a brief rundown of the series, but who's got the time for that? Oh, LS Mark, I didn't see myself drag you in here. I suppose you're a raging Sonic fanatic. Nah, not really, to be honest. But hey, I'm always up for a collab. So I can just steal some Sonic facts from my friend Splash Dash and we can jump right into this. No, oh, a man of plagiarism. I like your style. Uh, just like the time you stole that video game creepy pasta episode idea from me. Good times. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I I, I think I released that video before yours, actually. So anyways, like GoMotion was saying, there's really no need to go over Sonic's history or how he had a rough transition into 3D. All you need to know is there are four games, Sonic 1, 2, 3, and Knuckles. Not really these other bunch. They were huge hits, and elevated Sega's reputation to a genuine threat for Nintendo, who at the time had an absolute stranglehold on the video game market. By the time Sonic & Knuckles released in 1994, Sega had risen up and acquired a 55% share of the market. And I'm no numbers guy, but I'm pretty sure that means they had more than Nintendo for a bit. So after rising to the top, Sega only had one thing left to do. Stether. Which proved to be quite the challenge for the company. They were desperately trying everything to remain top dog. Releasing an add-on for their console to extend its life, having a surprise launch for their next big system which caught everyone off guard, another add-on. They were scrambling to keep that share and it was very apparent. But despite none of these attempts ever managing to work, Sega always had that blue ES up their metaphorical sleeve. With the advancements in technology, it were now possible to create games controlling a character in a fully 3D space. 
and companies were starting to take advantage of that, with the Nintendo 64, Sony PlayStation, and of course the Sega Saturn. And with Nintendo showing off their brand new revolutionary title Mario 64, and PlayStation even managing to get some pretty heavy competition with Crash and... I don't know, Bubsy I guess. All eyes were on Sega. It was vital that this next Sonic game blew everyone away. The system was priced at $400 at launch. Sega desperately needed a system seller. And who better to turn to for that than Sonic? Huh. Wow, that's kind of goddamn embarrassing then. Not a single main game Sonic for the thing? Nah, all I managed to churn out were ports of Mega Drive games and a shitty racing spin-off, which unsurprisingly kind of sunk Sonic's reputation for the first time, and allowed his competitors to run well on past him. But like, did Sega really never plan on having a main Sonic game on the Saturn? I'd like to think they aren't that incompetent. Uh, yeah, well, I did just mention that they scrapped Sonic Extreme. You could have assumed that they planned the game first. Well, I wasn't here for that. I was back in Ireland. Don't weasel your way out of this one. You heard half the title. Sonic Extreme, the brainchild of Michael Kosaka and Chris Sen, is regarded as one of the most infamous cancelled games of all time. This thing began its life as a pitch for a game aiming to release on the 32X by the working title Sonic Mars, the last of three pitch attempts to then head of Sonic Team Yuji Naka, who upon looking at Sen's concept animation, simply shook his head and said, good luck. And then Kazaka, lead designer for the project, left Sega almost instantly, leaving an inexperienced Chris Sen to then take over the role under the impression it'd be a temporary position. It wasn't. Yes, we're off to a good start. Development over the course of the project seems doomed from the beginning. Seemingly, with each attempt to increase efficiency, demonstrate the thing to higher ups, rework and improve the game time and time again, Sonic Extreme's mix of poor management, confusing cross-communication, and just some whack-ass luck faded of a cancellation. And after failing to meet its slated Christmas 1997 deadline, it was scrapped for good. And it's a real shame too, the passion for Extreme was definitely apparent. Despite the numerous obstacles flung at development, team members were determined, to the point of programmer Chris Coffin developing pneumonia due to the strain, and Chris Sen seriously ill due to stress, both given months to live, unless they quit the project in order to preserve their own lives. Several internal disputes didn't help either, disagreements and misunderstandings. It's really surreal how much of a calamity things really turned out to be for production, seemingly an amalgamation of totally disjointed reasons that ultimately culminated into the mess that was this game's development. And say what you will about how good the game would have been, a uh, recurring criticism and an official concern over the game is that the Saturn simply wasn't structurally stable enough to maintain Sonic's image i.e. loading levels fast enough to accommodate for signature speed, hence the slower paced gameplay of Extreme. Firstly though, while I for sure think level elements like the corkscrews and winding paths the game will automatically shoot you down are neat visual breaks in the action, arguably a sort of half trade off for the burst of speed you're rewarded with in the momentum based gameplay of the Mega Drive games, that was a valid take. Also the game featured this stupid awful garbage fish islands for a little bit. Yeah, it was supposedly proposed to have helped the player gauge a better feel for the immediate environment by allowing them to see the level geometry from further away, but no amount of 90s visual charm's gonna justify that for me, goddammit. Well, what are you talking about? This looks nauseating as piss to play with. Yeah, fair enough, hard agree, let's go with that. My point is, Sonic Extreme, with its crumbling development and questionable gameplay, was maybe a tad too ambitious for its time, and with the competitive space for 3D platformers quickly becoming more and more crowded by the more promising likes of Mario 64, Spyro and Crash, the odds feel like they are against Extreme from the start. That's not to say I think the game would have sold poorly or would have been a straight up bad experience necessarily, because Sonic is Sonic and well. And while the game wouldn't emulate the lightning speed of Sonic in his earlier titles, maybe the more condensed and slower gameplay would have fit better better to lend itself towards easing fans into controlling the blue bastard in a 3D space for the first time. You gotta learn to walk before you run a marathon is what I'm saying. I don't know, I feel like that dumbass fisheye lens decision kinda ruins it. If you need to add this ugly looking filter so that players can see what's ahead of them, then maybe that's an indication that something is wrong with your game and you need to go back to the drawing board. I mean hell, it seems even the designers realized this. Some of the latest screenshots of the game before cancellation, which we can tell because of the higher quality Sonic modeling graphics overall, that they ditched that look and went for something more traditional. And what do you know, it looks a million times better and that it could actually be, you know, playable. And that's only on the visuals, I, I haven't even talked about the gameplay. Because it's always a great sign for it to look like the player is struggling to stay on track in the damn trailer. It doesn't seem like Sonic has any kind of momentum, which was necessary for platforming with him. So when he speeds up immediately and stops on a dime, it makes it nearly impossible to play. Maybe they should have went with the Crash Bandicoot approach, where Sonic is running away from the screen to solve this issue in more hallway-like levels, instead of the more cylindrical stages they ended up going with. 
But yeah, as is, this game looks like it would have been a mess. You know what? Honestly, I wholeheartedly agree. The total garbage screen warping effect aside, a good chunk of the promotional gameplay footage released just seems so, I don't know, unpolished. There's even a moon or double jump feature exclusive to this game that genuinely feels like more of a dev cheat left in to guide Sonic back onto platforms he'd slide off of, rather than acting as a fitting gameplay mechanic that they wanted to include. Enter Jade Gully Zone, Extreme's Green Hell if you will, aka the Sonic stage with an identity crisis. This was the only conceptual render that was ever made, and from that spawned several different variations, all sharing variants of a jungle grasslands theme, and holy shit are they variants! This thing went through so many revisions in each build, and only like two of them featured controllers and like trying to park a helicopter. One of the most infamous playable builds of the game, featuring Jade Gully, as shown at E3 1996, unofficially ported on dumps back in 2015, features this god awful movement, and one of the highlight selling points of the game anti gravity aka rotating the stage geometry. What, you thought anti-gravity was the moon jump? Well, I mean, this was 90 Sega, so I wouldn't blame you for immediately assuming that this was them making another stupid ass decision. Also, yeah, technically Sonic could jump infinitely in this build, making it pretty clear that in this specific instance, it was intended for debugging purposes only. But if Sonic was still intended to have been able to jump impossibly in midair at least once yeah. in the intended final gameplay, that's it, my suspension of disbelief in the Blue Hedgehog game is broken. But while this is definitely one of the more complete feeling stages I could find, poke around in the right places and there's a sodding treasure over hundreds of test and beta builds to be uncovered, and it's honestly incredible to see so many of the test rooms I'd previously only seen snapshots of through old screenshots preserved and available to get my rubbery little hands on. Yeah, it doesn't mean the gameplay is any good. Sonic is fiddly as all hell, you're slip sliding all over the place and realizing that childhood dream of spinning in a washing machine. It just isn't all that great at all, and while I argued for slower paced gameplay, God, this ain't the way to do it. Oh, what's that? Oh, this Sonic 3? Yeah, I haven't found that yet. Give me that. This is the future. Though, admittedly, while playing around with this build and a good chunk of earlier tests, I have a good feeling that a stage rotation gimmick like this could have definitely had potential to integrate itself into the gameplay quite effortlessly. Maybe revealing new pathways or being utilized as a way to solve puzzles or navigate around previously impassable obstacles. But yeah, no, it's nothing but the fact gimmick. There is not a single instance where I thought, huh, migraine, useful, neat. Anti-gravity was a bullet in point to slap on the back of the box because they needed a reason to make the game visually distinct. It's like they sat down and said, guys, how do we convey to our target audience that this game is extreme? Oh my god. But man, it wouldn't even matter if they made the game mechanic work. Combined with how garbage the control is, it is way too easy to fly off the stage into the skybox. The way Sonic plays it stinks, though some of the later revisions of Extreme did end up utilizing Yuji Naka's Knights engine showcasing Sonic's movement to look and feel way more responsive in contrast to earlier builds, but for the majority of its short life, yeah, the short feels like controlling the puck in a game of air hockey. Of course, most of all of... <laughs> this, and really any of what we did end up seeing from Sonic Extreme in action at the time, was made up of recordings of alpha and beta builds of the game, so who's to say how bad the control would have really ended up in the final product? Well, it still would have been awful. Oh hey, regardless of how good the game would have actually been, there's no doubting the ironic impacts this can's disaster had. Its cancellation causing it to both garner a cult following and end up becoming regarded as one of, if not the most important factor, in the Saturn's commercial failure. Not only was there no mainline Sonic game, but they ported Sonic 3D Blast as well, anybody with a pulse in the year 1996, I am so sorry. I mean, sure, the game was upgraded in almost every way, but come on, who wouldn't rather be spitting up stomach acid over this? Despite all this, though, Sega's marketing team, obviously in the dark over the game's development cycle, went nuts with how hard they pushed Extreme's branding, aggressively marketing the thing with merchandise, and an infamous E3 trailer. So, Sega were either incredibly confident in the idea that it'd do well, or figured, well, it's Sonic, we have nothing left to lose if we piss it up. As for that E3 trailer, and 90 Sega does what 90 Sega does best and shits on Nintendo, featuring some of that clearly incomplete footage of the game they were trying to hype up the press for. They try to make this thing look as good as possible, but after playing the betas this footage was ripped from, it's really crazy to me how little was really finished for it. As for the physical garbage they put out, yeah, it's like if you liquidized an entire laser tag and poured it into an injection mold. It's plastic shit for blacklight slash neon aesthetic nerds like me, everybody, and... Goddamn is most of it highly sought after. I mean, with the marketing campaign cut short for products that were technically limited run anyway, yeah, the scarcity of any of this stuff was Zinnamons, with a relatively decent variety of toys and apparel pulled with campaign. And hey, of course, nothing says Sonic more than, uh... Extreme sports and neon colors. Obviously, Sega's marketing department weren't given a clear theme or aesthetic to drive into the promotional material. No finalized extreme exclusive characters, memorable locations, unique motifs. Uh, unless you want to count these glorified checkerboard alpha build looking ass stages, yeah, this game had nothing. So, you take this, slap my favorite vowel of the alphabet at the start of it, and oh boy, extreme sports branding. And the neon shit here too, sure, and I've already figured that one out. Yeah, that's so bizarre, and it's not like they used this in any way that would actually make sense, like Sonic Extreme Bicycles or Sonic Extreme... 
I don't know, rollerblades? Whatever. Point being, when I see Sonic mountain climbing, my immediate thought isn't, oh boy, yeah, I'd love this on an ice cream bar. The Sonic Blue Bunny ice cream bars have been a staple of ice cream trucks for decades, still running to this day. And from what I hear, they're pretty popular. I mean, I've never tried this one since, you know, I don't live in America, but... Wait, wait, go motion, have you had one? Shopping centre. I'm ready to shut up. That's how we say garage in the UK. Nope. Great. Okay, so anyways, I'm sure they're good. Point being, Sega being the geniuses they are, figured that they could start promoting upcoming Sonic games on the packaging of the ice cream bars, such as Sonic Adventure and Sonic Generations. But did you know back in 1996 they were actually using the label to promote Sonic Extreme? It's so bizarre how prominent this game was to just... never come out. I mean, some ice cream trucks still use the sticker on their van, unknowing of what rare Sonic collectible they've been sitting on for decades. So if any of you Americans are out there and happen to see one of these stickers... Then take it and send it to me. Oh me! You know, less cast of plagiarism on my part, it's good to weigh your options. Speaking of stickers though, oh man, this game just wanted to plaster itself over any kind of motions as it could, huh? We got a good few sticker sheets here, very nice. We also got a Glow Zone Sonic Extreme Glow Color In Zone Coloring Book, and I'm just scratching my head at this thing. What's Glow in the Dark? The pages? Some theoretical pen it may or may not have come with. Yeah, it comes with 12 free Glow in the Dark posters, I guess. Just stick them into the pages and call it a day. Oh, and hey, more Frozen Treat brand deals. This time, Sonic Extreme stickers with Zuper Duper branding slapped into the corner of each. From what I understand, these would have been included in sticker sets that would have come in Zupa Duper bags in Australia to promote the game. Cause nothing says extreme fitness like freezer pops. Huh. You think anyone's selling off this kind of stuff? There's gotta be someone who realizes the intrinsic worth of cheap promotional merch released only to hype people up for a video game they were never going to release. I mean, yeah, I'd guess so, but my internet speed is what I like to refer to as total dog shit, so we'll see how that goes. Oh hey, wait, the eBay tab I opened a couple months ago finally loaded. How wildly convenient. I think my bank account has a phobia of me. I'm personally a sucker for useless plastic garbage, so hold on to your hats. I own a 20-year-old c AM FM radio for children. Suck it. I mean, while there's not much to this thing, it's a pretty neat novelty to own. The color scheme's definitely up my alley, and at the very least, it's a cool piece of physical history to have in my hands. Featuring sonic stereo headphones, a flexible rubber antennae, a built-in belt clip to non-existent AA batteries, and a one-year warranty guarantee, oh hell yeah! There was almost a small series of plastic junk like this with a stereo cassette player and a pair of walkie-talkies included. You know what I'm also the proud owner of? Yeah, 120 Australian dollars worth of rusted metal. Nah, I kid. Sorta. Of. While the back of one of these is in pretty crummy condition, these are some pretty sweet detailed enamel pins featuring Sonic on wheels and pure terror. The idea of anything capable of doing this mastering martial arts haunts me. There's a bunch more miscellaneous stuff here too. Here's a slick looking pen of the logo, which by the way looks a whole lot cooler in context of the whole neon themed branding. This looks fan made. This looks like they actually wanted to sell the video game they were promoting. Here's the only photo I could find of some shirt with art of Sonic playing sock. Football. There's also this total amalgamation of an illustrated kids book which was titled simply Sonic Extreme and features the Neon Sonic participating in extreme sports shtick that was shoved into marketing, but it also features elements from the Sonic the Hedgehog Saturday morning cartoon series, namely Robotnik's design and mention of the Freedom Fighters in the book's blurb, forming a super weird mishmash of styles. I mean, I totally get why this happened, Sonic Extreme had no distinct identity, so sure, I get it, familiarity sells, but this just looks so weird seeing these two side by side in official art. Strangely enough though, Robotnik's Stray design is surprisingly prominent throughout Extreme's branding. And while it is unknown if this really would have been his in-game design, I'm looking at it more with the they had nothing to go off of, so they used the popular associated look at the time to represent him angle. Technically at one point, however, while the game was under the working title Sonic Mars, it did in fact use the show as a basis to work the game's plot off of, with elements of the show such as the Freedom Fighters integrated. But whether or not that had any influence on the marketing decision to do that? I don't know, no. This book was published in 97, so well into the development cycle of Extreme. Ergo, it's hard to imagine anybody intentionally basing any official branding off a years old iteration of the game. So that was a spattering of merchandise offered to promote the game, and... Man, doesn't it feel like, like, 90% of the marketing budget for this thing went way into the plastic shit? Yeah, I mean, in the 90s this was nothing new for Sega. They went all out in their big Sonic releases. Sonic Adventure got similar treatment when it eventually came out, getting ice cream bars and random bits of useless merchandise no one in the right mind would even want, like a pencil topper or a giant bop bag. A bop bag? Yeah, a bop bag, everyone's got one. But yeah, back in the 90s, Sega had the money to go in hard with merchandising, and Sonic Extreme was no exception. Although it probably would have made sense to release some more general items, like you make a cassette player when you're really running out of ideas. What do you mean, Sonic and cassette players got good like Sega and not being a disappointment? They don't. 
Yeah. Well, that was a brief covering of Sonic Extreme. This is a game so riddled, no, dense with history, that trying to unpack it all in one video would probably give me a migraine or seven. With that being said though, there's a lot about this thing that just interests me so much. I'm sure Mark could say the same. There's so much to discuss and definitely some topics here and there that I definitely want to toss about a tad at some point in the future. But I have a strict anti-rich shirt policy. We've got to take care of this guy real soon. Yeah, speak for yourself. It's a sweater. Now, Sega is no stranger to cancelling Sonic titles, wouldn't you know, Mark? I mean, Splash Dash. But it's clear to me, Sonic Extreme was just that one game in the series that would have had that charm to it not a lot of other games seemed to capture at the time. I don't know, man. There's just something so captivating about this thing, right? I don't even know if it was intentional, but this definitely felt like it was shooting for a bit of a darker tone than any of the previous entries. Music, visuals, environments, there's something weird about the way Extreme encapsulates a feeling of grittiness, and combined with the context of this feeling like the forgotten, forbidden, hidden away Sonic title and all that's up to a genuinely interesting game to get down and dirty with. I think the way the pre-rendered character and enemy models look definitely are a factor here too. The way they let Scream's early game promo CG to me, which in its own way, through scanned in renders and photos, more often than not totally gives off that spooky archival feel. And does not the strangely obscure and unsettling collection of gaming history of questionable quality what we all deserve at the end of the day? Hey Alice Mark, time's a ticking. You got anything else to say about this train wreck of a game? Yeah, I mean at the very least I think it's safe to say that Sonic Extreme would have had a massive impact on the series if it did come out. Whether that would have been a good or bad impact, we'll never know. But hey, at the very least, it gives Sega a little longer to experiment with Sonic in 3D, and could carry over that knowledge to future titles such as Sonic Adventure. Which, if you look at the Saturn game Sonic Jam, we can see that the Sonic World Hub is actually an early prototype for what would become Adventure. And already, that little hub world looked like a massive improvement on Sonic Extreme, and what it looked like it would have been. And even beyond that, smaller parts of Extreme still lived on in other ways, such as possibly using a refined model for it in Christmas Nights, or using this desert tile texture in Regal Ruin from Sonic R. And Sega learned a very important lesson about not rushing and screwing with their game developers. For about a week, they sort of repeated this same development pattern a few times since then. Yeah, it's kind of a miracle Sega's still doing well with the whole existing as a corporate entity kind of thing, huh? And clearly, Sonic Extreme wouldn't be the first big hiccup in the gaming industry with going defunct as a first party developer and several Pans games to come. This definitely set the precedent early on for the rest of the franchise. But while Sega themselves cans the game and everything to do with it, Chris Sam would later go on to host a horde of scrapped and behind the scenes content from his work on the game under the Sonic Extreme Compendium, or SXC, in a subsection of his site, Sentient.com. A ton of assets were sent salvaged and preserved this way. Storylines, images, videos, music, sprite sheets, concept sketches, you name it. It's almost surprising just how well documented everything here really is, and could easily have contributed to Extreme's modern day following. The dude even had a dedicated forum to interact with and answer fans curious over the game's development history. It's seriously cool to see Sen active in a community built around the love and intrigue for the project, despite everything Extreme's development put him through. Unfortunately, Sentient just ain't a thing no more for one reason or another. However, a couple of fan sites dedicated to archiving the Extreme Compendium do exist to this day, which is always dope as hell to see. It's definitely important and genuinely cool to keep this kind of content around. I highly recommend you go check them out. Well, hey, thanks for coming on, Irish internet personality LS Mark, voluntarily. I wouldn't be so sure about that last part, but sure thing, Gomo. But you know what? I think we all learned something here today. Though we can put aside our differences over who might or who might have not stolen video ideas and come together through the common ground that is our appreciation for this shitty cancelled Sonic game. And really, isn't that what matters at the end of the day? <laughs> yeah, Duncan on Sega is something I can get behind, and it wasn't getting into all this with you. Oh, and hey, something to remember me by. Oh, thanks. What, uh, what, what is this exactly? Uh, just a couple of video rough notes. <laughs> you know, figured I'd give you a head start on copying me this time. I'm going back to Ireland now. See ya! See <laughs> ya!